When we're young, we have an amazing, positive outlook about how great life is going to be. But somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refuse to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Yes, good morning to you. How are you all world? Every listener out there in internet land, welcome to Join Up Dots episode 88. And we've got a marvellous guest today. Uh, It's one of those guests actually that when I sort of look at her history and the things she's done, I, I do feel slightly ashamed that all I've done is get on a train and go up to London five days a week. Um, She really has created an existence which is a bit of a wow. She's a lady who could literally be singing, I'm on the top of the world looking, that's enough of that, Um, every time she jumps out of bed. Because since university, she's had a fascination for climbing and took part in her first mountain expedition to the Ruwenzori, I do apologise if I've said that wrong, in Central Africa at the age of 21. And something clicked in her. Was it the challenge, the camaraderie, or simply the thrill of doing something that so many people just don't get to see or do? Whatever it was, since that first climb, she's tackled mountains across southern and central Africa, in South America, in the Alps, and of course, in the Himalayas. When she stood on the top of the world and made history by becoming the first woman to reach the summit from the North and South peaks. But though her days on the world's highest peak now seem to be at an end, in her words, I have no intention in going back, her first for adventure seems unquenchable. And in spring of 2004, she joined British woman Rona Kant and Norwegian Per Tor Hansen on a dog sled expedition of 650 kilometers through the remote wastes of the Norwegian Arctic to the most northerly point in Europe. With all these experiences just bursting from her, it's no surprise that she's also climbed twice to the top of the book charts too, with her two self penned books, Everest, Free to Decide, and Just for the Love of It. So before I mispronounce any more words and names, let me say it gives me a great pleasure to bring onto the show to start joining up the dots that made her life the one and only Kathy O'Dowd. How are you today, Kathy? Very good, David. It's lovely to be talking to you. Honestly, did I mispronounce that name, Ruin Zori? No, you got it spot on for the English pronunciation. I don't think any of us are going to try for the local pronunciation. So your your life is is a wow, isn't it? It's it's one of those lives that is is kind of got Indiana Jones elements to it. You know, I couldn't do what you have done in any shape or form. I just haven't got it in me. So if we went right back to sort of the early days, which is what Join Up Dots is all about, and you were sort of a five year old, ten year old, was was this kind of adventure in you? Were, were you the kind of tomboy girl who was always climbing up trees and running around having an adventures? Hmm, I'm not sure that it was terribly obvious. I was the only child at home. The brothers were much older and we had a huge garden and I certainly spent a good deal of time deep in the, you know, in the corners of the garden, uh, living out adventures in my head. But I don't think anyone would have pegged me to be, you know, the first South African to climb Everest, for example. I was quiet and shy and bookish and hated sport at school and wasn't any good at any of it. I don't connect rackets with balls all that well. And uh, so, no, I don't think it was in any sense obvious. And I certainly wasn't spending my childhood dreaming about summiting Everest. I mean, it never even occurred to me. Well, I don't think it occurs to many people. And to be honest, I have thought a lot about you um, before you've come on the show today because, I, you know, we, we all know where Everest is and I don't want the whole conversation to be about Everest in any shape or form because that's, that's really not the interesting part about yourself. But I wouldn't even know how to get there. I know where it is, but do you, is there a, a nearby airport or do you have to fly in to India and, and then transport everything across? How do you actually get to somewhere like that? Well, it's changed enormously over the years. I mean, the old days of taking a, a, a ship from Britain to India and then setting out on foot were not being quite sure where Everest was. You know, that's where we were in 1924. By the time I got there, you fly to Kathmandu, then you take a small plane into Lukla, and then you walk for about a week to get to the base camp. These days, they're taking a helicopter to Camp 2 
to six and a half thousand meters and starting from there. So it's, it's changing. It's the, the nature of the adventure and the challenge is endlessly changing. Did you feel like saying to people, oh, it wasn't like my day. We had to put effort in to get there. There's a little bit of that. But then I appreciate that when I climbed it, the people who'd done it 20 years earlier were in a position to say exactly the same thing. And it was true. The way I did it in the early 1990s was easier than what was happening in, say, 1975. And that's just part of growing older, is standing there and realizing that the world shifts under your feet, that the new generation have a different perspective from what you had. You start to sort of owe a mental apology to some of your elders who you might have been a bit um, short with when you were young and thought you knew everything. But you also realize the world has to change. It's one of the things that lets us move on is the capacity of each new generation, hopefully, to let go of, of grudges and old hurts and move forward to their own vision of the future. I don't know what your childhood was like, but I, I feel a, a deep regret that my kids are not having a childhood that I had. Now, I grew up in the United Kingdom in the 70s, and I've mentioned this numerous times in, in the shows, because it's something that kind of, it's a bugbear of mine, where I was always out and about, on my bike, whizzing around. What time do I have to be home, mum? Be home for dinner or be home when it's dark. And that was it. We just cleared off. And nothing ever really happened. We might have broken a bone every now and again. But now there seems to be this kind of vibe that the kids only have to go down the road and they're going to be taken and you never see them again. And I, I think in that way, um, progress isn't good. There, there's a, there's a, a connectivity of fear by mobile phones and the media that stops people having the kind of adventures which probably you know i can't see a lot of the kids in my environment even contemplating doing what you've done because they're so in their bedrooms on their xbox having that kind of life i agree with you up to a point so i also had a childhood that had far more adventure in it than it is allowed now I spent hours on my racing bike wandering through the suburbs. I remember being about 13 and a girlfriend and I from school, we headed off into the felt. So our sort of wild grasslands around the edge of the suburbs. We grew up in Johannesburg and we just disappeared off into the felt on these dirt tracks on our racing bikes, which of course are the wrong bicycles, but they didn't have mountain bikes back then. And eventually, of Inevitably, we managed to puncture the tires on our racing bikes. So we started walking home. And, you know, after a number of hours, Gail's mother eventually got slightly worried that we hadn't been seen for a bit. And I think we got, it sort of got pointed out to us that wandering through the felt as two 12-year-old girls might not be the best idea in the world. But, you know, it was, it was a great adventure. I remember it uh, with pleasure. And certainly when I went on my first proper expedition to the ruined Zori. So that's Central Africa. We headed off into what was then Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. There were just two of us. I went off with a young man, mostly because they'd meant to be a bigger group, but everybody else dropped out. And eventually Stephen and I were the last two left standing, and we were determined to go. I barely knew Stephen. All I knew was he was the ex boyfriend of a friend of mine and he'd broken her heart which well, yeah, wasn't a great introduction but he was a good climber so off we went into Central Africa no telephones no blogging no social media my mother just waved off her only daughter and youngest child to disappear into Central Africa for six weeks and she just had to trust that I'd come back and I didn't in the sense that there was this was just before the civil war broke out that is still rumbling in Central Africa. Uh, the flights from Sabina, from Belgium, got cancelled. We had to scramble to get ourselves on new flights with somebody else, maybe Air France. I turned up two days late. My poor mother didn't know what was going on, but she just had to put up with it. But I think it's a mistake for us to get some kind of golden nostalgia about how our childhood was wonderful and modern childhoods are, you know, they're just different. I will tell you that growing up in South Africa, you know, we only got television when I, when I was about seven and we didn't even get it in my house. I had to go to a friend's house to see a television. 
This was South Africa under sanctions. This was South Africa under a puritanical, restrictive, and morally flawed government. There were so many ways in which our lives were restricted, in which our knowledge was suppressed, because we just didn't have access to other ideas. There's so much I've learned, even as a middle-aged woman, by getting on the internet and being able to look at what's being talked about in other countries, in other communities, in different social groupings. I wish I'd known some of that stuff, particularly as a young woman, particularly in a puritanical society. There's a great deal of good coming out of this interconnected society, uh, and I don't think we should lose sight of that. I, I agree with you, but there's still there's, there's that freedom, there's that natural freedom that is being lost. There is, but recognising it is a step towards that. And even if parents have a hard time not hovering over their children, particularly there seems to be a certain judgment from other parents. You hover because you're afraid people will judge you for being a bad parent if you don't hover. But, you know, maybe the children eventually can, you know, turn the phone off and disappear off into the wild and see what they find. Or hell, keep the phone on, disappear off into the wild and post your photographs to Instagram. It's fun. You know, again, there's, it's a different way of living. And I think we simply have to embrace that. So, so let's go back to that moment. You're in university. Stephen says, let's go off into the Rubenzori. Um, did, did your mum not kind of go what the hell are you doing what was because as a child you were saying that you weren't naturally adventurous in any shape or form and then suddenly you're doing this kind of trek into the unknown was there a kind of surprise element in your family that their daughter was suddenly doing this Mm, not exactly partly i have a great deal to thank my parents for Uh, And partly that's a bit too simplistic. I mean, I went off to summer camp from the age of about 12 in the Drakensberg, which is a big chain of mountains. And although I was, you know, I wasn't disappearing out there on my own and camping wild and things like that, I thoroughly enjoyed being in the mountains. As soon as I got to university, I joined both the outdoor club and the rock climbing club. I gave up on the outdoor club because they drank too much, but I really liked the rock climbing club. So the, the moment my parents were probably slightly taken aback was when I came back at the age of 18 and announced that I thought rock climbing was a great sport and I'd be off on my weekends rock climbing with the club. And they sort of said, mm, okay, how does that work? And okay, I mean, how safe is this? And then, okay, if you think that sounds like a good idea, sure. And my parents despite being very suburban and not doing any adventurous outdoor activities themselves, apart from a little bit of walking. And despite my being the only girl, the youngest child, and they'd already lost a son in a car crash, so they knew what it meant to have a child die. All they ever said to me was, okay, how can we help? whether I was going rock climbing, whether I was heading off to Central Africa, when I took off to Europe for a year between university degrees to go climbing in the Alps, and eventually when I announced that, oh, look, I'm on the first South African Everest expedition, (laughs) there'd be this sort of slight silence as they absorbed it, and then it'd be, okay, how can we help? And for that, I owe my parents an enormous debt of gratitude. But that must be down purely to the way they raised you. You know, that they had faith in you to make the right decisions at the right time. Oh, I think it's a real nature and nurture debate. They certainly exhibited that kind of faith. But childhood is always a mixed bag. We, we take lessons from our parents of the things we admire, and we take lessons about things we're absolutely not going to do in our own lives. And so, yes, I took away from my parents a strong sense of a base and of good support, of being able to try things. And then if it didn't work out, I trusted my parents to kind of offer a safety net. And that's a huge help in life. I think a lot of middle class people fail to appreciate how much easier our lives are if we had a good safety net while we tried things, particularly when we're young. But on the other hand, 
It was a very conventional upbringing. Uh, I went to a school that tried to produce, you know, well-educated, nice young woman, you know. We, we were expected to have careers, but we were expected to have quite conventional careers. And I regret feeling, I regret playing it safe. I regret spending so much time trying to be a good girl and please my parents and my teachers and therefore not trying anything where I thought I might fail because that might result in somebody being disappointed. Mm. I also looked at my parents and took away two very strong lessons, which, you know, eventually go into the whole idea of how do you, how do you join up the dots of your life. From my father, I took the lesson of I do not want a corporate job. Nine to five, you know, 50 weeks a year in your suit off to some anonymous office. I mean, he was a very successful businessman, but it just didn't resonate with me. And from my housewife mother, my very able, frustrated housewife mother, I took the lesson that a woman needs to pursue her own dream, not just the family dream, and she needs her own money. She needs to earn and control her own money because money helps with, with freedom and choices. I agree with you I with the nine with to five. I, I did the I, nine I to five for many, many years. I was the suit man and I was getting on the train, going up, getting on the underground round London, doing it, doing it, doing it. Now I'm not doing it. It is like I put new glasses on and I think to myself, how, how did I do that for so many years? If I have to go up to London now, just going on a day trip, it feels like a, a, it feels like a working day just getting there, let alone actually then doing nine or ten hours in an office and then coming back again. So there is, it's amazing how so many of us still have that mentality that we come out of university and corporate land is the only opportunity to earn an income and have a living. And we, we kind of migrate through the same life that our parents have done previously. I think the really important thing is to understand what you are passionate about crossed over with what you're good at. I do think it's a bit of a waste of a life to be terribly passionate about something you're truly terrible at. Uh, so I wouldn't diss anybody who's working their way up the corporate ladder. You can make some big changes in the world when you have a big team behind you and you have a lot of resources at your disposal. So if that's what excites you, there's nothing, there's nothing to be ashamed of in pursuing the, the corporate job and climbing the corporate ladder. Uh, you can be very effective in your life. And my father was enormously effective uh, in his life. He ran the social responsibility program for South Africa's biggest company. And he changed thousands of lives through the distribution of money. Uh, particularly under apartheid South Africa when there was no government social welfare into black communities. Uh, so what I think is important is to say, you, who are you? What do you want? What are you good at? And then extricate yourself from a set of expectations that says, well, people of your class, your gender, your color, your nationality, whatever it is, are expected to do A, B, and C. And, oh, no, X, Y, and Z are not appropriate. So it's not just saying, well, I'm going to dump the corporate job and I'm going to become the self-employed entrepreneur and I'm going to sell a million books and I'm going to have a million listeners to my podcast or, or whatever it is. All of those are great. But you could also turn around and say, you know, I'm just going to wander off into the mountains for a bit and see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to sell a million books and I'm not going to have people who, who know my name. I'm just going to live a quiet life doing things that really enrich me. Or I'm going to stay at home and have a parcel of kids and, and roll around on my carpet and have great fun being a stay-at-home parent. Or I'm going to chuck it all up and go and, you know, I don't know, live in a, a cave in the Himalaya and be at one with my, my inner self or something. There's so many possibilities. And I think what's a shame is when we shut down people's sense of possibility. I, I wouldn't diss anybody's choices. You want to make choices that are true to yourself without damaging other people and then have the freedom to go out and give it a try. I agree with that totally. I do, do agree with that. Certainly in my situation, I was on a route where I didn't have the passion. I was just doing it because I didn't know what else to do. 
And I think that's the shame. And that that's the, mm. the thing that we're trying to get across on these shows about, you know, there, there's a, a million different ways of living your life. But if you're just going through the motions and you're working nine to five because, hey, you're not willing to take action or you're not willing to take a risk or, you know, if you are in a job and you love that job, brilliant that that's all we want for you but if you hate every minute of it where a lot of the guests i've been speaking to have been in corporate land or they have been in some kind of job or a relationship that really was just just killing them then you've got to take responsibility and the tagline for the show is connecting our pasts to build our future because i'm a great believer as you were saying there that if you look back at all the things that you really enjoyed or you were naturally good at or you had the passion and you group them together you've got a pretty good chance of having a life which is which is fulfilling absolutely uh but i think that needs to be done with a certain amount of self-honesty. And it's quite hard to do it to yourself. I think that's why it can be terribly useful to have other people you can turn to and kind of compare notes about what you think you're good at and what other people think you're good at. Uh, because we, we sometimes, we often underestimate ourselves, sometimes we overestimate ourselves. Either way, it's quite useful to have an external, I don't know, a balance. Because it's, about what we're passionate about. But it's also, I think, about building on the strengths that we have. And that's a combination of natural talents plus what the environment we're in has given to us. I mean, one of the things I do is work as a, as a motivational speaker. Uh, not in the sense of telling people to stand on their chairs and, you know, start shouting rah-rah, <laughs> but in the sense of of using my experiences on Everest to talk about uh, teamwork and leadership. So the idea is to take some kind of lessons of life from a very unusual situation that relate back into people's everyday challenges, whether it's, it's the work or the marriage or life, anything. But you know, in that environment, there's a, a lot of young people come in, join our professional association, the Professional Speaking Association, and go, I want to be a motivational speaker. I want to stand on stage and talk about myself and get paid. It's like, yeah, okay, <laughs> fine. But w what are you bringing to the audience? This is not just about what you're passionate about, uh, being a motivational speaker. It's about what you're good at. What do you have to share? What do you have to say? And so I don't believe in, you know, sort of the shortcuts about, oh, if you dream it, you can do it and you can do anything you want. And no, let's be reasonable. Everyone has certain weaknesses and certain strengths. You'll make your life easier if you play to your strengths and then get out there and see, look for the sweet point. It's the same as when we try and raise money for expedition projects. There's the thing that you absolutely want to do and nobody else cares about. There's the thing that the company wants to sponsor and you think is boring as hell or, or you know, just really tacky or it's been done before or yeah. it's a gimmick. What you're trying to find is the sweet spot between what you're excited about and what you can get paid for by a sponsor. And when you find that spot, that's where you go. And I think the same goes with this kind of follow your passion idea in your life you're looking for the sweet spot between what you're passionate about what you're genuinely good at and about what will realistically pay the bills in whatever way you feel your bills need to be paid well i think that's the perfect part of this show to actually bring in the words of steve jobs now steve jobs back in 2005 said this speech and it resonated greatly with me and it's been resonating greatly with 99% of the um, guests. Not everyone's liked it, but I'm going to play the words now, and I just want to get your feelings about these words and whether they're relevant to you. So this is Steve Jobs. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. How do you feel about those words? Are they true or not? 
they certainly resonate with my life experience, definitely. Uh, because I think I've never really believed in kind of looking forward and having this sort of 20-year plan. I think when I was younger uh, and goal setting was kind of a, a new shiny idea in the self-help market, and there was a lot of sort of long-term goal setting and all the stuff about visualizing your goals in order to achieve them. And I always thought, well, how on earth am I supposed to know? I mean, I don't know who I'm going to be in five years' time, and I certainly don't know what opportunities will have come my way between now and then. How am I supposed to make a plan that doesn't allow for all the, the wonderful and weird ways in which life offers you the unexpected opportunity? Mm. I've always thought of my life as being more like a a river. Uh, so I'm rafting down a river full of rapids. And I've got a, some control. You know, I can make decisions about like, running down the center line through the rapids. I can go off into an eddy to get my breath back. Uh, I can try and pick my line based on what I can see. But in the end, I don't know what's coming around the corner. Rapids will take me by supplies. The boat may flip and I have to scramble my way back into it. You know, life life runs forward and I can't actually stop that. So I'd much rather ride it and, you know, try and get the most fun out of it, controlling what I can and just accepting the rest. So I'm much more about, about the journey and about taking what is with you currently, grabbing those opportunities, trying to play to your strengths, trying to steer towards the things that interest you, but accepting that you don't have total control. You know, things happen. Things happen to your personal life. Things happen to the economy. Things happen to the country you live in that you can't control. Do you think that that is a, a fundamental part of your character? You know, thinking, I, I do want to get it onto Everest because it is something that our, I know our listeners will be fascinated with. But the thing that would scare me about going up Everest is the fact that I wasn't in control of it. I could be up there and the weather would change and bang, that would be it. But you seem to be more at peace with the fact that, hey, it's going to happen. I will deal with it when it happens. Yes, I guess I am. I actually do, you know, a fair amount of what might be called extreme sport or or sort of risk sport, whether it's uh, backcountry skiing, ski mountaineering, uh, the high altitude alpine climbing, rock climbing. I mean, you, honestly, you do not have to be on Everest to kill yourself. You don't have to fall down 2,000 meters. You've just got to fall down about, you know, five meters. That'll do. So risk is not only existing on Everest. And I'm interested in risk. I like the process of trying to manage environments, not in the sense of seeking total control, because you don't have total control. You don't have it on Everest, and you do not have it in your everyday life, whatever you're telling yourself. There's a great deal that's out of your control. So what you're trying to do is understand your environment and then walk a path through that environment in a way that is both safe and satisfying. But and 100% safety is not particularly satisfying. But how do you understand an environment that you've never been in before? The, 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 the first time that you go up Everest and there must be, you know, I, I can only, I've, I've never been there. I've only seen it on telly. But I imagine for the first maybe five days or whatever, you're, you're, gen, you're walking across quite nice slopey hills and stuff until you get to the bit that, that starts really going up. But how do you accept that environment when it's the first time? It must take you by surprise, even with the most most sort of unfocused view of this could be terrible. When it becomes terrible, it still must be shocking. Ooh, no, no, that's <laughs> not how I see it. Am I just because, a wimp? <laughs> not at all. But I think Everest is not super exceptional. It's not as if you've been parachuted onto a completely strange planet. Everest is an extension of what I've been doing since I was 18, which is being out in wilderness environments. So I went on to Everest with a big body of knowledge. It wasn't complete. It can't be complete. The whole point about trying something you haven't done before is it's interesting because it's not complete, because you're about to tackle the unknown. But you walk into it with a skill set 
And it's a practical skill set and in the sense of I know how to use crampons and ice axes and ropes and I know how to judge weather and I, I know how to judge snow slopes. It's not the same in the Himalaya. The weather is a bit different. The snow is a bit different. The kind of, of technical challenges I'm going to face are different. That's why it's interesting. But I have a practical skill set and I have a mental skill set. I've put myself in situations already where I am tired, where I'm making decisions after hours of effort, late at night, when I'm cold, when I'm stressed, etc., etc. And that's what I like. And that's actually why I wouldn't go back to Everest, for example. I'm more interested in taking the skill set and moving it forward than in repeating the same old comfort zone. And Everest can be a comfort zone just as much as anything else can. You know, when you're on your 15th ascent of Everest by the same route, it's a comfort zone. So it's, Everest is not different. This is the same as anybody who's standing there thinking, I've got a skill set uh, of practical learned skills in my job or my environment and of mental skills that I've built up over the years. Now, do I have the guts to take that skill set into a new challenge and see if I can, you know, adapt, survive and, and hopefully succeed? That's where life gets interesting. But that's interesting. And I take your point totally that we can take these skill sets and we can put them in a different environment. But so many people out there, the listeners of the show, have got those skill sets and they're unwilling to try, even in environments that aren't going to kill them. You know, you go from one office to another, you go from one job to another, you go from one situation to another. The worst case is in their mind. But you must have had mm. both. You must have had those doubts in your mind. And you've also got the, the situation you're in, you know, the weather, the, the, that people have died constantly over the years and years and years. That makes you a different beast, doesn't it? I, I honestly, when you say the things like you're cold and you're stressed and all that, I would think, well, don't do it then. That, to, to me, it's not that I would love to go to the top of it, but I would like to be dropped on it, have a quick look round, and then flown off again. I, I could not possibly go through the hardships and the discomfort that you've gone to test those skill sets out. I'm, I'm fascinated by your mind. It's not the same thing at all. And one of the things that I do run into, because I use Everest as a metaphor in, in my corporate speaking work, is that people assume that the metaphor is conquering. The metaphor is goal achievement. Clearly, the metaphor is about standing on the summit. But honestly, this, you spend about 10 minutes on the summit, and it's a pile of snow. And yeah, the views are nice, but they're not actually all that different from the views you had 200 meters lower. Is it not rocky then at the top? No, it's snow. It's a... It's a cap of snow so so could could it go a bit wobbly well it is it is wobbling i mean not very slowly it's it's both managing to grow very slightly year by year because the himalaya are still rising and the snow itself is sort of slowly sliding off to one side there's a tripod up there left by the americans and it's very slowly sliding down the side of the mountain because the one question I'm not going to ask you is what it's like to be at the top, because I bet you've had that question millions of times. But I am interested, how big is it at the top? Is it like, are you hanging on to each other, or is it as big as a football pit mm -hmm. field or, or something like that? It's, well, it slopes off reasonably gently to start with and then pretty steeply. But the true highest point is, you know, the size of a dining room table. Uh, it's it's a very much a pointy peak. It's not a tabletop. So there's a real sense of being on top. But the point I want to make is that that's not what it's about. And this is so counterintuitive. It's And I guess this doesn't work for everybody. Some people are goal-orientated. And I, I understand that. I don't get it, but I understand it. I'm process-orientated. I'm there for the journey. I'm interested in everything it took to get up and everything it takes to get down. It's not over because you're standing on the top and people do tend to forget that one. Well, that's but the thing. I wouldn't forget that. And I don't think I could enjoy myself that I put myself through so much effort to get to the top. And then potentially, I suppose, the dangerous bit, because you're, you're already absolutely exhausted, is getting back down again. I don't think I could enjoy myself up there. 
Well, yes, clearly it's not your thing and it's a good thing to know about yourself. You're not going to waste your time, you know, having your midlife crisis by signing up for an Everest expedition, <laughs> which does happen. You've you nailed know. me. You've nailed me in about 35 <laughs> minutes. You know, and, and it's good to know that about yourself. You know, the things I know about myself, including the fact that I couldn't stand a nine to five corporate job. So I'm, I'm not going to try, despite the fact that I get twinges of envy when I sit at some big corporate event and there's some man or woman who's the CEO of a big division and has thousands of people under them and, and has budgets of millions of dollars and can make all these big changes and they're younger than me. And I think, oh, ooh, yo, that's success. And I think, no, no, it's, it's, it's their success. It's not my success. I can be briefly envious while knowing, that, uh, knowing why I chose not to do that. But what I'm trying to say is that Everest, I do enjoy that stuff. Uh, in the moment, being cold is a pain in the ass. But in the bigger picture, knowing that I can deal, that I have coping strategies, that I can work through that because by getting through those cold moments, I will arrive at somewhere that I'm truly excited about, I'm really passionate about. I will get to do things and see things and be part of things that are so wild that you simply can't be done without putting up with the tough stuff. And, you know, being cold is, is like really obvious tough stuff. But anybody who's successful is wading through a whole bunch of tough stuff to get there. Success is pretty much tied up in hard work. And the hard work can be hard to see. I mean, it's not just, you know, the, the drag of corporate life or the, the fear of falling off a mountain. Raising children well, there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of head-banging frustration there. Almost anything that is done really well has involved hard work, discipline, just teeth clenched determination to get through something because mm. you need to, to get to the good stuff. And I think, you know, it's a mistake to underestimate that. Anything worthwhile will have required sacrifice, determination, discipline, grit. And we shouldn't shy away from that. It's part of what makes the, the successes, the outcomes, the places we arrive so, so fulfilling to us because we've worked for them, we've earned them, we own them. That's why climbing a mountain is interesting. And that's why it's worth it, even though in truth there's a high probability that you'll fail. You must be capable of failure. On a mountain, the person who tells me Winners never quit. It's like, dude, you're going to die. There's situations where the mountain becomes too dangerous. You must back off. I'm not going climbing with people who are not prepared to back off. How, how do you know that moment when it is too dangerous? You don't. And it's exactly the same as anybody who's out there being an entrepreneur thinking, oh, Jesus Christ, when do I give up on this dream? When do I cut my losses and move on? And there's, you know, situations where it's dead obvious that this isn't working. The situations where it's really obvious, this is great, push on ahead. And there's a massive gray area in the middle. And there is no magic moment for entrepreneurs or for mountain climbers or for anybody else who's facing failure. There's just previous knowledge there's uh, learning from other people's experience. There's your own gut instinct. And then you've got to make a choice and live with it. And I think fear of failure, you know, is, holds people back really badly. I was listening recently to a rather good podcast from Freakonomics about, you know, why quitting is a good idea. Why quitting quickly and efficiently and, you know, with complete commitment can be a very useful skill yeah. set. And the same goes for mountains. There's a point at which you look around and you think, Ugh, uh, no, 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 let's go home. Let's leave this one for another day. And don't second guess yourself. Just get out of there. And you may be wrong. Other people may go on and reach the summit and damn it, they, they were the success and people look at you and think you were a failure. Uh, you didn't have the courage, you didn't have the determination or something, whatever. You made your choice. You learn something by making that choice. You move on to the next project 
And when you make the next set of choices, they'll be informed by what you know from the previous round. How do people know that you've reached a summit? That's an, a, a thought. That just <laughs> How do you just not go three quarters up and then say, I've, I've been there? Is there an honesty that I'm not seeing here? Oh, well, in the very practical sense, yes, that's an issue. In the old days, you took a man at his word, so to speak. Uh, these days, it's all more commercialized. There's more money involved. People have sponsorships, et cetera, et cetera. It matters. People have lied. It's known that people have claimed to have climbed mountains that they didn't. There are a certain set of a sense of mountains which are in doubt. Some people believe them, some people don't. It's, you know, it's a good idea to have a clear record. It's a good idea to have photographs and video and preferably a witness. But in the end, if you get caught up in one of these situations where your camera fails and your video camera fails and you climbed it solo and you got to the top in the mist and everybody goes, oh, I just don't believe you're that good. Why were you climbing? If you're climbing only for public recognition, then yes, it's a failure if you can't persuade people of the truth of your claim. But if you're climbing because you get something out of just being out there, yeah, it's hurtful if you're not believed or it's hurtful if you're criticized, but the other gains you made are still there and they're still real and you take them with you. I think it's really important when people do anything, whether it's climbing a mountain or, or setting up their own business or just trying to live their daily lives, why are you doing it? Not in the sense that maybe you shouldn't be doing it, but in the sense of what do you get out of it that really matters to you, that really enriches your lives? Because you will be getting those things even if other people are criticizing you or even if other people aren't understanding you. Yeah. And if you've got a certain clarity, it makes it easier to do it despite fearing failure, despite being worried about what other people might think of you. If you can look at it and say, yeah, just by trying this thing, by taking part in this, I will enrich my life, even if it doesn't work out, even if I don't reach my summit, my stated goal, then yes, it's worth doing it anyway. Because I, I was chatting to a gentleman called Niall Doherty on episode 72, and he's mm. traveling around the world east, but he's not allowing himself to fly. And he got to the Atlantic Ocean and he had to get a cargo ship across. And I thought, mm. as most people apparently think, that that's the cheapest way of doing it. And you, you pay X amount of pounds or dollars or whatever and you'll be on this cargo ship for a few weeks. But he said it cost him like four and a half thousand dollars. And he was on the boat for four weeks, not seeing anything, just water all the way around him. And I said to him, you know, well, why didn't you just fly and then tell people that you've done it? I mean, you could have had a nice holiday at the other end and stuff. And he said, because I would have known. And that's what you're saying now, isn't it? You ultimately, you've got to live with that with that guilt, that consequence of of mental torture that you will have every single day, having people think that you've done something that you haven't. Well, yes, I think that's true. Uh, it seems very odd to be setting out to do a particular challenge and then lie about it. But that's not actually my key point. I mean, that's kind of a negative thing. That's about, oh, we, we don't do it for the guilty conscience. I'm interested in the positive side of it. I understand why he doesn't fly, why he puts up four and a half thousand pounds, because he's interested in this particular challenge. He's interested in whether he as an individual, can make this work. And the cargo ship is what makes it work. So he gets on board the cargo ship and sees how it goes and thinks, Jesus Christ, that was a high price to pay. But mm. yeah, hell, I'm still on my feet. I'm still moving. That's great. What I'm saying is when people do things, it's helpful. To, it'll keep you on track if you really understand why you're doing it. I have no idea why he's excited about going around the world without an aeroplane. I understand the underlying impasse. I don't, you know, particularly understand his the exact challenge he set himself. But everybody, you'll be doing something that other people don't get. You'll be giving up the nice corporate job to go freelance. Other people don't get that. I don't get you'll it myself sometimes, I'll be honest. 
fully did. That's yeah, true. We doubt ourselves. People will be giving up the entire bloody success rat race to kind of stay at home, you know, work minimum wage and, and spend time with their children or, or just chill out and work on their art or whatever it is. And a lot of people will will look down on those decisions. It helps enormously if in a positive sense, you know, this is why I'm doing this. This is what I'm getting out of it. This is why these choices fulfill my potential, meet my passion, enrich my life. Talking about choices, I, I've been reading a lot about you over the sort of last few days, as I say, and um, there was a fascinating tale, very harrowing, about y you going up Everest, getting to about 250 metres from the top, which surprised me when you were saying it was going to take five hours to go 250 metres. I thought, my, my God, it really, you know, it really must take it out of you. But you found a lady who was close to death, and you had that decision whether to carry on or try to save this lady's life, which it seemed to me from reading it, she was like past the point anyway of, of being saved. But you had that decision to continue with your own personal quest or give up. And that was fascinating to me that you'd made so much effort, so much ex um, financial expense to get to that point and you were willing to give it up for a human being that you, you didn't know. Um, yes. Well, I mean, to be clear, it didn't work. Uh, she did die anyway. But I think it would be, no, I, I can't imagine stepping over someone and just keeping going. I mean, that's not the point. I'm not on the mountain in a all or nothing quest for the summit. I'm on the mountain because I enjoy the process of climbing. I enjoy the process uh, of the expedition. And one of the things that happens in climbing, just as in real life, is that we are a network. We're connected in, at the most basic level by our humanity. Within the climbing community, we're connected by our passion for climbing. And although we do try and be self-sufficient and we do try and be safe and we, we don't go onto mountains assuming that we can do anything we like and then just expect strangers to save us, we also accept that things go wrong. We do not have total control. You can have, be trying to run a really efficient, safe, careful expedition and still have it go badly wrong. And then you hope that your teammates or your friends or in the end other strangers will, as best they can, help you. And you give that forward. You help other people. You hope that other people might help you if you ever need it. It's, it's the golden rule. You do for others what you hope will be done for you. But there seemed to be a group pressure in that situation from, from your colleagues or people that had seen the lady the day before that were saying, come on, let's just leave her, you know, she's gone. But, but you weren't having it. You were saying, no, I've got to stay here. I've got to do something. <sighs> Yes. I do want to make it clear, though, that this isn't as simple as saying, oh, there were some, you know, awful, callous people, and then there was me fulfilled with, you know, human righteousness or something. It's not that I was right. I, was, I wasn't right. In a sense, the Sherpas particularly, who were the most level-headed in this setup, were right. There was nothing we could do for her. So it didn't change anything to stop and we did lose the summit by stopping and you know our sponsors weren't particularly happy uh you know it wasn't there was no terribly good choice there and yet i wouldn't want to not stop when as soon as i saw her i suspected there was nothing we could do but i still wanted to try to make quite, quite sure that we were right. And in the end, we did have to leave before she actually passed, for which I've been heavily criticized. Uh, but having established to our own satisfaction that we really couldn't see any way in which we could save her life, staying with her then put our own lives in serious danger. And you know, does it help if everybody sits down and dies with her? Probably not. So uh, we left. I went down. I just 
couldn't refine the passion that makes me climb in that situation. I'd had enough. And that's okay. There's situations where life hits you hard and you say, oh, right, I'm done for a bit. I'm going to go home and try and regroup, uh, refine myself in this situation. So it's not as simple as saying I was right and someone else was wrong. It was a horrible, messy situation with no good answers. And other people might have made different choices. And I think, you know, I'd support their right to make those choices. But the point I was making more than anything was your mental strength, your mental strength to stand for something that you believed, whether the people around you believed the same thing or not. Bear in mind that your sponsors were annoyed, as you say, that you didn't quite make it to the summit. And it was almost, in the greatest sense, touching distance. It was, you know, I, I imagine if it was clear, you could almost see it. But you still had that, that mental strength to go, I'm going to do what I think is right. Well, I think what works here in a life is not to be driven by goals, but to be driven by values. Goals are useful. Certainly in my life, I'm actually inherently fairly lazy. And goals get me out of bed in the morning. <laughs> you know, goals give me focus. Otherwise, I could just wander around the house drinking cups of coffee and not getting much done. So, so goals keep me, you know, moving forward. But I'm not entirely invested in the goals. My life doesn't fall apart if I fail to reach them. My existence isn't validated by achieving those goals. The goals just keep me moving. What I think is more important is working towards a set of values. And that's almost easier because you can carry the values through very ch changing situations where you may lose the goals because the weather changes or you get caught up in someone else's disaster or the, the world economy tanks. You know, There are a lot of ways in which your goals are out of your control. But your values you carry with me, you. And I don't want to be the person who walks past someone who's in trouble. I have to accept that I, I may not be able to help, but I want to have tried. And the same goes for the mountain climbing. I don't want to climb mountains like a tick list. You know, I've done a couple of 8,000 meter peaks. Well, I've done two, and I've, I've been on three. And a lot of people say, well, oh, clearly you must be doing the, eight, the 14 8,000ers. And you go, well, well, no. Because I'm interested in each specific expedition and each particular mountain. I'm not actually just interested in a tick list and taking the easiest route and a commercial expedition and be, you know, employing a guide and outsourcing the decision making. Uh, that, that, that doesn't do it for me. I want, I want to make the decisions. I want to only do projects where I'm genuinely excited about that particular thing. And I think at least some people do sort of go through life being just being buffeted by the forces around them without really thinking through what their underlying values are, what matters to them, not just you know, right now, but in the big picture. When you look back on your life, do you want to say, I lived it as I believed in living? Do you know what you believe as a in a lived life or are you just going to go back and say Jesus life happened to me just before we put you on the sermon on the mic and send you back in time to have a one-on-one -on -one with your younger self which I think is absolutely the right moment after those words you were just saying then I've just got two questions that I would be mm -hmm. it would be wrong for me not to ask and one of the ones is about Everest I always see that people go up the north and the south can you not go up east and west or is that just something that I haven't read Everest is actually a three-sided pyramid. So there's the southwest face, the north face, and the east face, and then, and then three major ridges. There are actually, I think, 15 routes on Everest at the moment, 15 different ways up. And there's potential for at least two more, although they're incredibly difficult and dangerous, which is why they've never been done. So no. There are other ways up Everest. And again, you know, I'm serious when I say that even something as you know, apparently extreme as Everest can become a comfort zone. People do the two classic routes, the route Edmund Hillary took up the Southeast Ridge and the route George Mallory took up the North, uh, the North, the Northeast Ridge, no, the North Ridge, because we have so much information about them now that they've become quite a lot easier. 
They are the two easiest ways up the mountain. And the fact that there are a lot of teams on them makes it easier as well. You're not on your own. The work is shared. There's a great deal of information available to you. There's literally hundreds of people going up and down each day, I understand. Not each day, but in a season, there will be a number of hundred people on the mountain. And some people say that this somehow devalues Everest, but you don't have to go in the season. You know, we're talking about spring, April, May. You can go in autumn. You can climb Everest in winter. It has been done. You can take one of the other 13 routes available. You can go and try and climb those unclimbed routes on the east face. It's not Everest that's been devalued by these crowds. It's our wish to get adventure and achievement without actually putting in the work and dealing with the uncertainty of trying the really difficult, challenging option. It's not the world that's selling us short. We're setting ourselves short by trying to get the big return while taking the easy route towards it. Mm. I think I've, I think that is the the strap line for this show. Really, if anyone is listening to the show, and I know there's millions of people listening to this show, rewind that bit and jot it down and and write it on your arm so you can look at it five times a day because that that is the the key words to it. When when you're laying in bed, Kathy, because as I say, I contacted you and said, "Would you come on the show?" And you very kindly said you would. And I I've been thinking about. You were the first woman to do something. I have never, ever met somebody who was the first. You know, I'm the first in my house to get out of bed each morning, but the first on earth. Does that blow your mind? Because it it blows my mind. I still can't quite grasp. It's the same thing as, like, Usain Bolt. If he raced anyone on earth, he would win. And you think, my God, you know, anyone that comes up to him and says, "I'll, I'll give you a running race, he will highly likely win. And you were the first person, and that is your mark. And when you are gone, you will be in the history books. That's amazing, isn't it? You may be. But I mean, I was the first woman. I wasn't the first person. But the woman. The woman's a person. Well, well, yes, but I mean, it was fun. It was fun, and there's no doubt it's been useful. It's helped in my career since. It's made it that much easier to raise sponsorship. It's helped with the the corporate speaking that I do. And, you know, it's helped to sell the book and that kind of thing. Why are you so humble on that? Because that, that to me, is mind-blowing. You're the first. No one was before you. You, You're there. No one can rub your name out. You were the first woman to do that. I don't know. I guess I have an underlying feeling that... A life that gets too hung up on one thing is a life that has somehow been stalled. And this is particularly difficult, I think, for anybody who's achieved a great deal when they were young. What are you going to do with the next 30, 40, 50 years? Yeah. It's hard. Uh, any, particularly athletes, anybody who's been really good, really young. I mean, even Usain Bolt, other people will run faster. He will slow down. He will get injured. He will have many, many years ahead of him in which he's not this incredibly famous runner. Or, or he's kind of, he's known for something in the past. I don't think we should ever let a life get hung up on any one moment of success or any one moment of failure. When you look back at the, at, the, at the finish line, whenever it happens, the life is an accumulation of all the moments lived, all the successes you had, all the failures you survived, all the every days when you just got through the day and hopefully enjoyed that day. I think that's why I feel slightly uncomfortable when people define my life by the summit of Everest. You know, honestly, I probably spent, what, 35, 45 minutes of my life on the summit of Everest? But you, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've but, but you were the first. You were the first. I'm, I'm going to say that to everyone. I'm going to say, do you know? Yes, okay. And no, that was fun, but it's not the be all and the end all of who I am or what my life is about. I just hope that I'm in a pub one day doing a pub quiz and your name comes up. And everyone will go, how do you know that? And I can tell the story of when I tried to big you up and you wasn't having any of it. Well, I do, I do believe that I ended up being a question in the South African version of Trivial Pursuit. So there you go. There you That's- go. I've never met anybody who could say that either. That's two things. 
Okay, just before we let you go, this is the very last part of the show, and this is what we call the sermon on the mic. And this is when I send you back in time to have a one-on-one with your younger self. And if you went into a room and saw the young Kathy running through the fields of um, South Africa or just embarking on your first climbing trip, what kind of advice would you give her? So I'm going to play the music, and when it fades out, you're up. This is the sermon on the mic. Here we go with the best bit of the show. The sermon on the mic. The sermon on the mic. Take yourself seriously. That's my strongest message I'd like to send back to myself as a teenager or as a very young woman. You've got talent and you've got determination and you've got grit and you're surprisingly obstinate, actually, about sticking to the things you want to stick to. And you don't give easily to peer pressure and you you work, you work walk your own path, but you're kind of timid about it. And I'm not quite sure why. I think some of it's about being being a woman in a somewhat uh, patriarchal society, where success is a is is a more more of a man's thing. Some of it is about a strong instinct to be a good girl and please people, please parents, please teachers. You know, get do things right, and that's partly because you're actually quite bright. You get very good results in in school. Uh, but it does make you afraid of failing. You don't like failing. And that means you don't try things. And when success starts to come your way, things like the first time that a bureau phones up and says, you know, I've got corporate clients who will pay to hear you talk about your Everest experiences, you never claim that success for yourself. You always think of it as being luck. You think of it as being at the right place at the right time. You think of it as something that could have happened to anybody. And even as you begin to build your career, particularly uh, as a professional speaker, because that's the one thing that will actually pay your bills, even as you begin to you know, try writing books, you always tend to think of your success as luck. You don't own it. I wish I'd taken myself more seriously all the way through my career. I wish I'd seen opportunities and thought, yes, this is mine. I own this, and now I can work with this. I did do all of that, but I, I could have been more effective. I could have done it more in a more fully committed way. I feel the same about some of my, my sporting ability. Uh, I mean, I've done a lot. I'm, I'm fit and I'm strong and I have an enormous knowledge base in the mountains and I've got out there and done all sorts of things. But damn it, when I was young, when I was in my early 20s and I, was, I got fit so fast and I stayed fit and I had such natural strength, I wish I'd done more. And again, I think I needed to, to believe in myself more strongly, to take myself more seriously, to be less concerned about possible failure, to be more proactive about my own possible success. And I think there was one other thing I tell myself, which is to be less concerned about criticism from other people, be less concerned about pleasing other people and about not offending other people, and be more responsive to your own gut instinct. When other people tell you that something is a bad idea, you don't necessarily need to listen to them. You can just move on. When your own gut is telling yourself something is a good idea, Trust yourself. There are situations you could have got yourself out of earlier if you'd spent more time listening to your own gut and less time listening to, own your, to other people. Have more confidence in yourself. Own your success. Take yourself seriously. That would be my message. And that's a message to all our listeners out there. That, that is a masterclass. 
Do you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking, do you know, David, I'm the first person I know who's had a conversation with Cathy O'Dowd. I'm, I'm going to claim that. I'm going to claim that as my number one right. Um, but, but how do people connect with you, Cathy? Oh, I'm, I'm out there on the internet. I have a website at cathyodowd.com. I run an open Facebook, uh, which you're welcome to join, Cathy O'Dowd Everest. I'm on Twitter, Cathy O'Dowd. And linkedin and google plus and instagram and you know Flickr and all those good things i like storytelling i share photographs uh, uh i share stories and i'm always interested in in chatting to people connecting with people well all those links will be on the show highlights that will be coming out and um i understand that you've got an offer for our our listeners well yes in the interest of enjoying sharing stories I did write a book about my years on Everest, which is called Just for the Love of It. And it's available uh, in a new edition as an e-book with a, a new chapter that isn't in the print book. And I'm offering five free e-books, either EPUB or Moby for Kindle, whatever you would like. And what David and I have agreed to give podcast listeners a chance to listen to this uh, is we'll keep this open for a month. And the five most interesting tweets uh, that come into my account at Kathy O'Dowd about this podcast uh, will receive a free copy of the book. And David and I together will decide on the five most interesting. So it'll be kind of random, but not exactly. Absolutely. Just inspire. Tell us how you enjoyed this, why it inspired you, what you took out of this. And we'll take the five most interesting and give you a free book in return. Well, I'm writing my tweet already to send. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set them up to go out every 20 minutes and bombard under different oh, names. Oh, no, please don't. I'm, I'm going to have all of those books. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for spending time with us today, joining up those dots of your life. And um, please come back again when you have more dots to join up, because that's the beauty of this show. Our histories continue to go forward, so we've always got more dots to follow. And I really do believe the only way to build our future is by connecting our pasts. So, Kathy O'Dowd, Thank you so much. David, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed talking to you. David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free. And we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots.